from the Society of Illustrators in 1999. Author Cynthia Ozek has given Podwall the Hebrew name Baal Kav Emet, or Master of the True Line. As she explains in her essay, Ink Inkling, she writes, Podwall joins metaphysics to physics, essence to presence, ideas to real objects. The master of the true line is also master of hidden meanings of symbol and metaphor. In 1996, the Ministry of Culture of France named Podwall an officer of the Order of Arts and Letters. Hebrew College in Newton Center, Massachusetts in 2003 awarded him a Doctor of Humane Letters honoris causa. Beyond his works on paper, Podwall's artistry has been employed in a variety of diverse projects, including the design of a series of decorative plates for the Metropolitan Museum of Art. His work, and, and these are plates that um, he made for their collection. This is, uh, a, these are, are, this, this, is, this is a Seder plate, um, and as is this, and replicas of these works are uh, for sale at the Metropolitan Museum store. This work has been woven into an Aubusson tapestry that, the, that adorns the Ark in the main sanctuary of Congregation Emmanuel in New York City. And that is um, shown here. This is the, uh, the uh, this shows you the Torah R curtain made in 1996. He's represented by the Forum Gallery in New York and has exhibited there since 1977. His papers are archived at Princeton University. Podwell collaborated with Academy Award winning filmmaker, Alan Miller on the documentary House of Life, the Old Jewish Cemetery in Prague which was narrated by actress Claire Bloom and was broadcast on PBS in 2009 and 2010. In 2011, Podwall received commissions to illustrate a new Passover Haggadah for the Central Conference of American Rabbis Press and to design new embroidered textiles for Prague's 700 year old Altnishul. Also in 2011, he received the Jewish Cultural Achievement Award from the Foundation for Jewish Culture. In 2014, at the Terezin Ghetto Museum, there was an exhibition of Podwall's cycle, All This Has Come Upon Us. The 42 paintings and drawings, disturbing reminders of how Europe's extensive history of Jew hatred laid the groundwork for the Holocaust have been published as archival pigment print portfolios. So you see here two from that series, Psalm um, 44, which um, verse 18, which is the title of the portfolio, all this has come upon us, but we have not forgotten you or been false to your covenant. And you see the um, goose stepping Nazis carrying the uh, menorah that was uh, in the temple in Jerusalem that was carried out by the Romans. So he's, when, when they destroyed the temple, so he's you know, sort of making an analogy between these two uh, moments, terrible moments in Jewish history. And on this one, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat as Zion. So this is um, sort of reflecting the long wanderings of the Jews in exile, um, but always at home in their sacred books. And of the most loved were books that had songs, prayers, and memories of Jerusalem. So uh, this is part of this portfolio. And um, portfo this particular portfolio has been acquired by the Library of Congress, Yad Vashem, which is the Holocaust Memorial in Israel, the Bodleian Library, the British Library, the Institute for Advanced Studies of Harvard, Yale University, Princeton, Columbia, Hebrew University, National Library of Israel, among many others. And um, Czech Television produced and broadcast a documentary on Podwall's Terezin uh, ex uh, exhibition. 
Um, now, it, not all of his work is related to the Jewish experience. So um, the Metropolitan Opera posters, um, he, his current projects include a poster for each new Metropolitan Opera series, also a series on Mozart and Prague, a series Kaddish for Dabroa Bialystoka about the Jewish, about the Polish shtetl where his mother was born, and illustrations for Heinrich Hein's poems, Hebrew Melodies. Very recently, uh, Glitterati published, which is a very popular, uh, oh, this is the Mozart in Prague, sorry. Uh, there's uh, Hebrew Melodies, Heinrich Hein, about Heinrich Hein's poems. And very recently, um, a 374 page monograph was published by Glitterati, a very well-known art book house. Uh, it's a monograph called Reimagined 45 Years of Jewish Art by Mark Podwall. So it is no wonder that the Skirball Museum is really thrilled to and honored to own 18 prints by Mark Podwall. And I'm going to sort of explain how that came about uh, before we look at the works. It all began with a phone call from the artist early in 2016. Now, now it's not every day that you get a phone call from a renowned artist. And while he may not be renowned in all circles, he's certainly renowned in Jewish art circles. So the phone rings, hi, this is Mark Podwall. I wanna make drawings from your Judaica that you just absorbed from uh, the B'nai B'rith Klutznik National Jewish Museum's collection. And I'm like, Okay, it was really sort of uh, a very exciting moment. Uh, he mentioned his familiarity with the collections of the former B'nai B'rith Klutznik collection of sacred and secular fine and decorative arts that had been transferred in 2015 to the Skirball Museum. He proposed a set of drawings inspired by some of the outstanding examples of Judaica, ritual and ceremonial art from the Klutznik collection, and even advanced a title that was a witty play on words, drawing from the B'nai B'rith Klutznik collection. How could I refuse? What an honor it was to have the opportunity to work with this world-renowned artist and to be able to highlight some of the most beautiful objects in the museum's collection in a way that would help people understand how they were actually used, but also uh, offer a little bit of a sense of humor about them. He chose to draw several objects from the Skirball's core collection as well for a total of 18, which is a good number. Uh, it means high or life in Hebrew. The artist had initially promised he would give us six of the drawings at the conclusion of the exhibition, but he was so thrilled with the installation that he ended up giving all of them. He loved the integration of the drawings with the objects, as you see here, and their proximity to one another and how accessible the objects were to the drawings. And the two men here, uh, you probably recognize Mark from a couple of the image photographs I've shown you. And this is Dan Mary Ashen, who is the uh, chief executive officer of the B'nai B'rith International, which was the organization that, uh, that housed the B'nai B'rith Klutznik collection. And when they downsized and moved offices, they no longer were able to sustain that collection. So it was transferred to the Skirball. So we absorbed roughly 1500 works of art and objects from that collection. And this was the first time that any of them were displayed when this exhibition uh, went up at the Skirball. So we're going to take a look. I think I have a couple of more uh, images of the installation that, that's without people in front of them. And you can see that wherever there's a, a drawing, there's a work of art right next to it or right in front of it so that the visitor or the viewer uh, can really make the association between uh, these beautiful objects of ritual and ceremony for ritual and ceremonial use and the way that Mark Podwell interpreted them. 
So we're going to now take a closer look at several of the objects and the uh, ceremonial objects that inspired them. Like all of his other work, but deceivingly so, you will see that they offer profound and nuanced commentary on Jewish customs and history. Um, here's another one really close up. So uh, I can never remember how many images I put in and another. Uh, and we'll be looking at all of these in, in uh, closer detail, but uh, get a nice, kind of like walking through yourself. So our text, ex, our text labels for this exhibition were designed to engage both Jews and non-Jews. Podwall's witty interpretations provided a window to understanding Jewish ritual and observance, particularly for our non-Jewish visitors. This cup on the left, used for blessing the blessing of wine on the weekly Sabbath or Shabbat, is inscribed in Hebrew below the lip with words from Exodus. And the, the Hebrew is right here. And the words say, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The artist has taken the words of the blessing over wine quite literally. Blessed are you, Adonai our God, sovereign of all, creator of the fruit of the vine. So when we think of fruit of the vine, we think of wine. But again, Podwall has been very literal and he has filled his iteration of that cup with the grapes themselves because they are truly the fruit of the vine. So it's, um, you know, whimsical and, and a little bit witty, uh, and it's called Shabbat, Shabbat Kiddush Cup Runneth Over. And all of his work is made of acrylic and colored pencil on paper. And um, the, the um, silver cup for the blessing of the wine was made in Germany. It was from 1861. And uh, this is actually one of the objects that is part of the core collection of the Skirball. It's not one of the objects from B'nai B'rith, but we will see many of those as well. Now, this was, this was an interesting and odd piece that hardly ever gets seen or talked about in the museum. It is a stamp for koshering, for marking kosher meat. And it had been relegated to storage. And when we had the opportunity to offer some objects to Mark uh, that he hadn't asked for, because he did ask for many specific things, which we'll get to in a moment, um, we just thought, well, I wonder what he could do with this. So this is something that was used um, when, when a kosher, kosher market uh, was displaying its wares when I was growing up. Um, I would often go with my mother to the kosher butcher. My family kept kosher when I was a very young child. And, um, you know, the, the, it would be stamped with a purple dye that was edible on the fatty part of the meat with this symbol that was the Hebrew for kosher, a, a Hebrew C, a Hebrew S, a Hebrew R. Now, today, the meat is, is the, 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 whatever signifies that it's kosher is on the packaging. They don't actually stamp the meat, but this was the traditional way of knowing that a piece of meat was kosher. And so what does Mark Podwall do with it? He draws a cow and he puts the letters in English, looking a little bit like Hebrew, uh, kosher across the cow, and then uh, makes uh, a drawing of the exact uh, stamp uh, and he calls it certified kosher. So, um, you know, this was something that was, uh, it was interesting for people to learn who didn't know about how one would identify kosher meat in the store, but it's also was very, very um, sort of nostalgic for people like me and others who remember that purple dye and uh, remember how the meat looked when it came home from the butcher. And then of course, when the meat is cooked, it also dissolves and it, it's not, you know, you don't even know it's there. Um, so of course, the, the regulations of kosh root uh, are the dietary laws. And these are observed by um, 
religious Jews, by very observant Jews, um, also by more liberal Jews who keep kosher, uh, not because they are following all of the laws that the Orthodox follow today, but because they want a connection with their history and they feel that doing this, keeping kosher, it, it, it gives them a daily reminder of their heritage and their history. And it's also a very healthy way to eat largely. Um, there's a lot of foods that were not kosher uh, because people figured out that they got sick from eating, eating uh, food that lives at the bottom of the ocean or uh, meat that wasn't cured or things that were raw, you know? So, so these, these laws really emerged out of uh, health considerations and um, a lot of modern Jews look to that and, and keep kosher for that reason as well. So uh, this was an interesting and fun uh, approach. Now, this is um, a Hanukkah lamp. It's uh, one of a group of lamps that were made in 1927 to commemorate the 25th anniversary of the founding of the Prague B'nai B'rith Lodge in April of 1902 and presented to each of the lodge members. It's what is called a bench style lamp, meaning that it looks like a bench, you know, it has sort of like a floor and a back. Um, and it's copied from a 17th century Italian prototype. And it has uh, a lion uh, in the center that's representative of the Lion of Judah, which is very often depicted in Jewish ritual art, uh, centered in the outline of a crown, a very sort of uh, abstracted crown. And that is a reference to the crown of the law. And the Hebrew inscription on the lamp reads, to kindle the Hanukkah lights. And again, in his very lighthearted interpretation, Podwald doesn't fill the holders for the oil with olives, uh, with, with olive oil, which would have been the kind of oil that would have been available in, in, the Med in Mediterranean countries. Um, he fills it with olives um, and that they, of course, are the source of the miraculous oil that lasted for eight days in the Hanukkah story. So um, each of the, the eight places where you would put candles in this or oil in this lamp are filled with olives, as is the ninth holder, which is the helper candle. That is the candle that you use to light all of the other lights on a Hanukkah lamp or a Hanukkah menorah. So um, this one is uh, just, it's a small Hanukkah lamp. It's only about so high. Uh, and, you know, it, 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 it was always lovely, but uh, it's made lovelier and more interesting by Podwall's uh, interpretation. Now, this is interesting because um, as this exhibition came together, I was so enjoying the weekly emails that I would get from Mark with the latest drawings and their clever titles. And this is one of my favorites. It, and when it arrived, I understood why Mark insisted on supplying him with a shofar, which is a ram's horn, with a relatively flat side. So, you know, shofars come in all sizes and shapes. Some of them are flat, some of them are twisted. It depends on the particular ram and the shape of their horn and the style of different countries in the way that they made shofarot or ram's horns. And, you know, he kept saying, I need one with a flat side, I need one with a flat side. So that we sent him this image on the left. And of course he didn't see any of these objects in person until he came to the opening of the show. So everything was done from images that we sent him of the pieces that, were go that he was going to draw. So the shofar is an ancient musical horn that is blown in synagogue services on Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, and at the very end of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. It's like a modern bugle in that it lacks pitch altering devices. 
I'm sure those who are tasked with blowing the shofar in front of the congregations each year long for valve stems and finger buttons. The carved inscription on this shofar reads, blow in a big horn for our freedom. The other side is in listen to the voice of the shofar. So, um, you know, it's very, it's a very hard instrument to play. Um, and typically it's done, you know, just these few times a year by someone who practices and, you know, imagine getting up in front of, you know, a congregation of 400 people and not getting a sound to come out. So it really kind of makes you chuckle when you, you look at the, the, um, stops and the, the, uh, finger buttons and you know, the stems and the finger buttons that, wow, this would make it so much easier. And um, this comes out of, you know, again, ancient biblical text where the shofar would be blown in the temple in Jerusalem. You know, people would be gathered in the atrium and the Holy of Holies would only be available to the high priests. And if they wanted to get people quiet or alert them to something, it would be this sort of piercing sound. It's not particularly musical it's 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 very harsh and it it's intended to sort of wake you up and make you be alert to what's happening around you to listen to the voice of the shofar so um it and he ended up calling it we sort of commiserated about it and came up with the name jazzy shofar so um it's it's really quite quite lovely Now the overall decorative quality of this Hanukkah lamp is reflective of the local architecture in Islamic communities of the Middle East. This was very typical of Jewish ritual art that whatever countries Jews were living in and making art in, and again, not all of the artisans were Jewish. There were a lot of non-Jewish um, artists who made uh, Judaica for the, the Jewish market, but Wherever Jews lived, they absorbed whatever the cultural milieu was. So if you're in a, a country like Spain or Morocco and you have a lot of buildings with you know, this kind of uh, like keyhole architecture, it becomes absorbed into the way you make your ritual art. In France, there are a lot of Hanukkiot with rose windows like Chard Cathedral or Notre Dame. So um, it's, that's a, a, that could be a talk all in itself, just the way that different countries uh, artistic styles are reflected in uh, Judaica. So in this case, this use of open work arabesques and arcades with pointed arches is very typical of Islamic arch architecture, which is seen on both uh, secular and religious buildings, such as synagogues and mosques. So this is actually the mosque cathedral. This served, was both a mosque and a church at uh, different times in its history in Cordoba, Spain. And you can see the same impulses in the way that the you know very, very busy, very, um, very uh, abstracted uh, symbols are used to create the the wall, the exterior wall of this building and how that's been absorbed in the intricacies of this Hanukkah lamp. Um, in this case, we have four very stylized peacocks that are sitting on the stylized branches on the upper section of the back wall of this lamp. And they may have been intended to symbolize light and the kindling of the Hanukkah lamp for Muslims associated the outspread tail of the peacock with light. So again, not only is it the actual physical symbol, but it's the meaning of the symbol that finds its way into uh, Judaic art. And this is an, you know, an excellent example of how the, the makers of these objects absorb the artistic and architectural styles of the countries where they live. Now, what makes this really kind of funny when we look at Mark Podwall's interpretation is that he, it brings a smile because he's offered us an electric cord and plug, introducing modernity while at the same time honoring the traditional nature of this oil lamp. So this is a lamp that, you know, has, you can see here at the base, these are just troughs that would hold oil and you would put a wick 
in that oil and that's how this would be lit. And then the server lamp is right here. So it's really quite, um, quite a lovely piece and it could be hung on the wall, um, which was a traditional way of displaying these types of lamps in Islam and uh, Spanish uh, Mediterranean countries. So let's continue. Let's see what we have next. Okay, oops, I just got in the wrong order. So this is um, actually a Torah crown. And um, this is something that is uh, on the left. You see this beautiful silver uh, crown. Uh, the Torah is, is, a, is, a, is, on, on a, is a scroll that's on typically on two uh, finials, you know, or on two rods. And, in or, and you, the, the Torah itself, which I think I, well, oh, I probably wouldn't have mentioned this the last time we spoke, but um, it, the, the Torah itself is not decorated. It is, it is, it is written and um, there, are, there are scribes who are, are trained to actually uh, copy the text um, and, and to make the Torah scroll, but there's no illumination, there's no illustrations, there's only the words, and there actually aren't even any vowels in the Torah scroll. Um, the, there are, are books of Torah that are written where all the vowels are provided, but when you read from the scroll, you are reading without vowels, and that cannot be changed. It cannot be any different in any scribe's writing of a Torah, but everything on the outside of the Torah can be, um, can be glorified, can have beautiful decorative qualities. And so often there are two finials, you know, usually made of silver or a precious metal that cover each of the staves of the rods of the Torah. Um, but sometimes there's a crown that covers both of the finials. And that's the case with this beautiful Torah crown, which is from uh, 1810 and it's Italian. And um, the, 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 the whole idea of the, this kind of uh, design came from um, the knobs that were at the upper ends of the wooden staves on which the Torah scroll is wound. And people began to notice that the knob kind of resembled a fruit and they named it a uh, Ramon. And Ramon in Hebrew is the word for pomegranate. And this was, became a tradition among Ashkenazic who are German or Eastern European Jews that they, they put at the top of many of their decorative objects, uh, a pomegranate or a Ramon. So when we talk about finials, we often say Ramonine, which is the plural for uh, Ramon or pomegranate. Now, why pomegranate? Why? Well, first of all, it's a very popular fruit in Mediterranean regions and in, uh, also in uh, uh, the uh, countries, uh, you know, Spain, Portugal. So people, they were, they were definitely, um, traded and you know everyone in Europe knew about pomegranates. Um, but the 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 idea of making a Ramon or a, a finial in the shape of a crown really did emerge in Italy in the 18th and 19th centuries. And so this, as I said, covers both of the wooden staves of the Torah. And in this particular uh, Torah crown, there are uh, panels at the base that have different Hebrew inscriptions and different Hebrew images. So uh, there's a menorah here. You can see a seven branched menorah and you can see here a table with shoe bread. This is the bread that is used to, cons that was consecrated bread that was used for offering by the high priest in the temple in Jerusalem. And there are other draw, there are other panels all around this. But at the top, you see, again, a knob or finial. Now this happens to be a 20th century replacement, but it, it looked similar. 
And in his interpretation, instead of giving us a knob on the top, he has actually just put an entire pomegranate on the top of this, uh, this particular uh, drawing. And um, of course the pomegranate symbolizes fruitfulness because it has so many and there's, there's a tradition in Judaism that it actually has 613 seeds, which is the number of uh, mitzvot or commandments that an observant Jew will, uh, will, will do every day. Now, I don't really believe that it has 613 seeds, but it has a lot of seeds. And uh, so when Jews, what Jews do say when they eat pomegranate seeds that they say, may we be as full of mitzvot or commandments as the pomegranate is full of seeds. So I can work with that, even if I don't believe that there are 600, exactly 613 seeds in every pomegranate. So uh, this is uh, uh, this wonderful sort of whimsical interpretation by Mark Podwall. Now we move to um, accoutrements for the Torah, like the finial that I mentioned. The Torah also can be decorated on the outside with a beautiful velvet mantle or dressing, and then a breastplate that would go over that, um, which is both beautiful and functional. Um, it's designed to hang over the front of the Torah mantle or cover, and it functions not only as an adornment for the Torah, as it but it also earmarks which Torah scroll should be used for which Torah reading on any particular Sabbath or holiday. So um, in this instance, you know, when you, when a, a, in a synagogue, uh, uh, an ark where the Torah is kept might have six or eight or four Torah scrolls with beautiful mantles and covers and finials, you know, just in, in that, in that space and every week the Torah is read um, and you have to open it to where it needs to be for that week's portion. It doesn't have any page numbers. You can't put a post-it note in there. Um, you know, you, you want to respect that it's uh, parchment and you want to be very careful with it. Um, you can't mark it in any way. So you have to know, kind of know, keep one Torah that you roll every week to the weekly portion, and then you roll it out a little bit more for the next week um, and, and try to, you know, and keep it rolled to that point uh, so that you can keep on moving forward. But uh, there are portions that are read at different holidays. So um, this particular Torah, um, Torah shield or uh, breastplate has the word Sukkot right here. So this can be, this little metal plate can come out and be replaced with one that might say uh, Yom Kippur or Rosh Hashanah or, you know, a different holiday. But if a Torah, if a synagogue has enough Torahs, they can keep their, this one with this breastplate rolled to the portion that's read for Sukkot so they don't have to look for it every time uh, they have to read, read it. So it has a purpose, um, but it's also very decorative. And you'll notice that th there are often bells on the bottom of these breastplates and they, they tinkle when you take the um, Torah out of the ark. Often the finials or rimonim also have bells on them. And that is not accidental. We know from the Bible that bells were at the bottom of the robes that were worn by the ancient high priests in the temple of Jerusalem, in Jerusalem. So um, that when, when the temple was destroyed and, and Jews sort of moved out into the world and we have what, what is known as the diaspora, there were no more high priests. So how do you recall or reflect that past, well, you, you take what was on the robes of the priests, which were beautiful, often beautiful embroidery, and you turn it into a metal breastplate that has bells, that has beautiful decoration, 
that can recall that moment in history, uh, but you know, serve the more modern, uh, the mo more modern world. So uh, that is why we see these bells and these beautiful decorations on these breastplates. Um, th this is a German example on the left. It's neoclassical in style, and it has columns that are surrounded by um, lions supporting a crown. We've seen that before in the Hanukkah lamp that I showed you. Um, there's a lot of gilding on this particular example that highlights the Ten Commandments that you see here in the center. And as I mentioned, Sukkot or the Feast of the Tabernacles is in that plate that indicates that this is rolled to the portion for that holiday. And um, this at the bottom, there's sort of a wreath that encloses the names of the donors of this particular uh, piece of ritual art. Um, and what has Podwell done with it in his interpretation? He's used it as an emblem on a flag for the holiday of Simchat Torah. So Simchat Torah is the, celebrates the, when, when we conclude the annual cycle of reading of the Torah and beginning again from Genesis. So it's a very joyous holiday. And uh, in many synagogues, they will unroll the Torah scroll and um, let people like hold the edges of it until it's at, at its fully open, uh, you know, uh, completely unrolled. As a museum person, it makes me a little nervous, but you know, once a year it's okay. And, um, and then it's rolled back to the beginning and you start all over again. So it's a, a holiday where there are flags and there are children and lots of festive dancing. And so he's used the breastplate uh, image as, you know, on the flag uh, in, to celebrate uh, Simchat Torah. So another of my favorites is um, this, it's, um, it's a mezuzah. And a mezuzah is a parchment inscribed with specific religious texts and attached in a case, usually a very decorative case, to the doorpost of a Jewish home as a sign of faith. Now among devout Jews, it's customary to kiss your fingers, bring them to your lips and then bring your fingers to the mezuzah upon entering the house and leaving the house. And so um, what, what Mark Podhole has done is he has taken a mezuzah by Ludwig Wolpert, who is a, was a very prolific metal worker who emigrated from Germany to Palestine in 1933, where he taught metal working at, at one of the most important schools of arts and crafts in the world, at which still exists today, the Betzalel School of Arts and Crafts in Jerusalem. And he later went to New York where he established the Toby Pasher workshop for Jewish ceremonial art. Um, and, and that is um, at the Jewish, was at the Jewish Museum in New York. So he's particularly known for incorporating Hebrew letters, Hebrew characters into his ceremonial art. And here the Hebrew on this design, which if you didn't look closely, you would just think it was the design, but if you really look closely, you recognize these as Hebrew letters. And it's the blessing, it, it's from Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse six, blessed art thou in coming and blessed art thou in going. So it's like the perfect line for, the, as you come into the house, you kiss your finger, you know, bring your fingers to your lips into the mezuzah and, and you leave the house, you do the same to remind you of um, to remind you of your faith, and um, of the of all of the images that Mark Podwall made for this show, this is the only one that's a collage because he actually cut out, colored, and cut out and applied the lips to his drawing of the mezuzah, and he said that it was the most challenging of of all of the pieces that he made for this show. Um, so it's it's again very, uh, you know, it, it was wonderful to engage with him around this. I didn't suggest it, it was totally his idea, but to actually not just to draw them on, but to make them, cut them out and apply them 
was something that uh, he hadn't done before. Now Purim is the most, is a very festive Jewish holiday that celebrates the deliverance of the Jews from imminent doom at the hands of their enemies. And it's told in the biblical Megillah, if you've ever heard the, the word Megillah, like just used in regular language, when somebody say, oh, have I got a Megillah for you? It means they have a long, complicated story. Um, but the word is scroll. Uh, and the scroll of Esther is a, on one rod, like uh, you see here, and it's, it's, it's you know, a, a long complicated story, but it doesn't take up that much space on a scroll. So it's, it's a single scroll. And um, in this story, there are in the, during this holiday, there's a lot of gift exchanging, there's a lot of drinking and eating, there's a lot of feasting, um, beauty pageants are associated with this holiday and watching plays in which costumed children act out the story of the brave and beautiful Queen Esther who saved the Jewish people. And, excuse me a minute. And drop something. Uh, and um, one of the traditions in, uh, in, in this holiday is that as the scroll is read, you know, there are the good guys and the bad guys. Well, the bad guy is named Haman. He was, he was the person who was really the, anti-hero who was all about um, getting rid of the Jews. And so when the scroll is read, you're supposed to say, when you hear Haman's name, there are noisemakers that you're supposed to use to drown out his name because he was so, so evil. And another tradition associated with it is that you're supposed to get so drunk that you don't know the difference between Haman, who was the bad guy, and Mordechai, who was Esther's cousin, who was the good guy. And so what has Mark Podwall done with this particular image, he's, or this particular object? He's put the scroll inside a wine bottle. So it's like you emptied the wine bottle and all that's left is the story. Um, and this is a particularly beautiful uh, scroll and it's miniature. It's only about this big, okay? So it's, unbelievably beautiful um, filigree and spiral designs of applied silver wire and depictions all around it from the story of Esther. And the artist is an, as a man named Ziv Rabban, who was one of the major artists at the Betzalel School of Arts and Crafts, which was founded in 1906 to promote a particularly Jewish art form that would be suitable uh, that was be for for the the for Palestine, which you know by 1906 there was already an effort to um, create a Jewish state. So this was um, the, he, this is a particularly valued piece in our collection, and it uses an art form that really sort of originated with Yemenite silversmiths, and this is still an art form that's being done in Israel, and you can go to jewelry stores and, and places all over Jerusalem and, and Tel Aviv and other cities and you know find these very finely filigreed beautiful objects that are still being made today. So um, again, it's, uh, he puts an empty, uh, the scroll of Esther in an empty wine bottle, uh, perhaps alluding to the Babylonian Talmud where it was stated that it is one's duty to make oneself fragrant with wine on Purim until one cannot tell the difference between cursed be Haman and blessed be Mordecai. So it's a little bit uh, nicer way of saying that you got so drunk that you wouldn't know them apart. <laughs> Since receiving the drawing, matchboxes have never looked the same to me. <laughs> Podwell was inspired by this sterling silver Hanukkah by a very well-known Mexican silversmith whose name is Juventino Lopez Reyes. His work is very highly sought after among silver collectors for his superb designs and quality workmanship. This example is very elegant in its simplicity. There's not much going on here. It's triangular in form, carries a star of David between the center peak and the base and lends itself perfect, perfectly, at least as Podwell saw, to a matchbook cover. So, um, it, you know, it's colorful and, and you know, just, I, I just would love to get into his head to 
figure out how he comes up with, uh, you know, how he makes this all work together. So uh, here is, um, here are a pair of uh, Shabbat or Sabbath candlesticks and we're coming to the end here. These are the last couple of objects. Um, and these are, uh, of course, lots of objects of great beauty have been fashioned to celebrate the week's Sabbath or Shabbat that commemorates the day of rest following creation. It begins at sundown on Friday with the blessing and kindling of lights and blessings over wine and bread. And the bases of these very ornate candlesticks contain panels that feature various biblical scenes including Jacob's dream, the binding of Isaac, Jacob wrestling with it, the angel, just to name a few. And what's in particularly exciting about this pair of candlesticks is that it was once owned by a Polish Jewish couple and the candlesticks later entered the collection of the Marquess of Exeter and have been exhibited at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. And uh, in his drawing of this, these candlesticks, the most attention is given to the flames. And if you just sort of glance at it, you just would walk by it and say, oh, he's made the flames yellow, but they're not just flames. They are the Hebrew letter Y or Yud. And in Jewish mystical tradition, a Yud, the Y represents a mere dot a divine point of energy. And Jewish sages have written that the yud, yud represents the world to come and completeness. It's the most frequently used letter in the Hebrew alphabet and the smallest. It's also written that it represents God's omnipresence. So it's a fitting point for Shabbat, which is really the chief holiday in the Jewish calendar. It's celebrated every week, but it's the most important uh, holiday. It, it's the holiday. You can't have a wedding on the Sabbath. You can't have a funeral on the Sabbath. The only thing you can have on the Sabbath is a, circ a ritual circumcision because that has to be on the eighth day. But it's, um, you know, according to the Talmud, the letter, which is the central text of rabbinic Judaism, the letter Yud wanted to be the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It asked this of the creator of the world, but it was turned down. Aleph is the first letter. The creator then comforted, comforted the letter Yud with the fact that it is the first letter of God's name and even appears twice in the divine name. So hopefully the Yud was satisfied with that answer. So I'll conclude and then give you a little preview of something with this um, spice container uh, for celebrating the the, the um, ritual of Havdalah, which ends the Sabbath, and it means separation. So uh, Havdalah is celebrated at sunset on Saturday night with um, also some interesting uh, rituals. One is smelling of spices, one is um, the lighting of a candle, and uh, also wine and um, a, a very special candle. It has several wicks and um, it, 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 it's all about the different senses. And as we separate the sacred from the profane at the end of the Sabbath. Um, so I hope that through this talk, you've had the opportunity to learn a little bit about some of the holidays and the way that uh, ritual objects are used and also to experience them in the context of Mark Podwell's delightful interpretations, which are, again, you know, they seem very lighthearted and whimsical, but it, they come out of a great and deep knowledge of the holidays. So I hope they brought a smile and maybe a chuckle to your, uh, to your face as you draw your own conclusions. But I do want to give you a, a little bit of a preview because Mark is coming back. And um, he is going to, he, we have just published a book with HUC Press called A Collage of Customs, Iconic Jewish Woodcuts Revi Revised for the 21st Century. Uh, this is the cover of the book. Uh, and he has, what he has done in this instance is he has taken a 1593 book of 
Customs. It's called Sefer Minhagim, which literally means Book of Customs. Uh, and there were many of these books of customs over the years of the Renaissance, the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. The Venetian 1593 volume is a particularly valued one. Uh, and from that 1593 volume, he made his own interpretations. So you're looking here at a Purim celebration from in Hagin from Venice of 1593. And you can see on the cover of the book that just like we saw that uh, scroll of Esther in the empty wine bottle, here we have a gentleman carrying a huge jug of wine and an empty wine bottle with the scroll of Esther inside. So he's appropriated these images and then inserted his own uh, sort of modern uh, approach to it. Uh, in the case of these two examples, he's, uh, taken the making of matzah, which someone commented to me, this doesn't look like matzah, it's not flat enough, but I think it's a perspective issue. But he's, he's exchanged whatever the oven was or the, you know, in the original 1593 with sort of a modern oven, almost looks like a microwave here. So he's again, brought his own interpretation. We know they're making matzah because these are matzah combs that are on the table, which would have been used to score the matzah to make the holes um, that now are done industrially. And just as an aside, that, that industry, that ability to make, to mass produce matzah, that originated in Cincinnati with the Manischewitz company, which was founded here in the 1880s. So their factory was um, down on, uh, first on 6th Street and then on 8th Street and the building where it is, was still exists, it's right by the viaduct, or the Western Hills viaduct, so just an aside. But anyway, um, and this is an example again, I'm not sure what was the, what originally was here, probably an ancient looking Hanukkah lamp. Uh, I don't have the text in front of me, but we will have a copy of the 1593, uh, Sefer Min Hagim, which we're going to be borrowing from the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York that will be part of this show so people can see the actual woodcuts that uh, inspired Mark Podwell. But he's put this giant light bulb and this modern Hanukkiah by Babette Block, who is a well-known um, modern silversmith. And, you know, he's inserted that into the image. So that show will be uh, at the Spurball opening February 10th and closing May 30th. So if you were amused or intrigued by his work, you'll have the opportunity to see uh, these 26 prints, which are going to be given to the Skirball and become part of our collection. So with that, I'll uh, conclude and um, take questions or comments. Um, hope you enjoyed it. I'll unshare. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Abby. Um, there are a couple questions coming in the chat. Um, I messaged one to you um, and I see a few more that just came in now. Does anyone have a question they'd like to ask directly? You can unmute yourself. Let's see, I'm gonna look at the chat right now and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And now, oh, I can see everybody again. <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard when you're when you know, I can only see like my face at the top. I hate it. Okay. Um, question from Rochelle. This exhibit brings to mind that more ancient shows of the form of a solid object. Okay. Good question, Rochelle. And yes, um, that is really that is really. Uh, a good observation, and um, you know, there's a lot of what I what we can say just is fact that even though there were biblical injunctions against the making of graven images and artwork, there was never a time in Jewish history when people weren't making art. But in the early iterations, the artwork was made in the service of ritual. Um, and, and there were times when there was a lot more freedom and, uh, you know, when people, when the Jews maybe didn't feel as threatened at a particular time in history, but, um, early Jewish art 
uh, really had to do with um, with ritual or manuscripts, um, with with uh, marriage documents that could be decorated. It's only the Torah that can't be decorated. Like even the Scroll of Esther can have decoration in it. It's you know so so there were lots of things that artists and artisans could make. Um, and of course, there were things that from very ancient times, like oil lamps and uh, things that were more utilitarian and some Jewish symbolism on them. But it really wasn't until the modern, you know, until the Enlightenment, uh, when we get into the 18th century and, and later, that artists really begin to branch out beyond uh, Judaica and they become artists who make paintings with people in them or sculptures of, uh, you know, th three-dimensional sculptures, which was the last sort of, sort of like, uh, you know, that was the last thing to happen in, in Jewish art, because think about it, you know, a statue of a person or a bust of a person. I mean, that's about as close to idolatry as you can get. And one of the really interesting things is that in, in the Skirball, we have the bust of Isaac Mayer Wise, who founded the reform movement. And from everything we can tell, it's the first three-dimensional sculpture of a rabbi in the history of art. Because it was like something, it was like so taboo to, to make a, a three-dimensional sculpture. So um, that's that's you're right that the early work is is really largely ritual so um okay so i just said the illustrations in the book are the, the original book that is the safer min hagim they were woodcuts so it's a woodcut you, you know that's you, you you make something out of wood and then you make a print from it so they're they're prints from woodcuts. That's what the original book is. Um, Mark Podwall's images are, uh, are, were drawings that, and he made a set of prints. We're not getting the original drawings, we're getting a set of prints, which um, very happy to have. And uh, that's, so that's the difference there. He did not make woodcuts. Um, <laughs> has anyone ever accused Mark Pottle of being sacrilegious. I'm thinking of flowers coming out of menorahs or menorahs made of bones. Uh, you know, I think that um, people who know his work, first of all, he's hugely um, respected in the Jewish art world um, because the people who really know his work know that he comes at this from a deep and abiding knowledge of Jewish ritual of Jewish uh, history of um, uh, of Jewish writing you know he, he is a scholar in, in every sense of the word um, so I have never seen anyone anyone write that this is sacrilegious that doesn't mean that somebody might not think it but what was so powerful when we had this exhibition and makes me absolutely certain that this is not sacrilegious is that it made people talk about these objects. It made people talk about how they were used. It brought to life objects which sit on a shelf or sit in a display case and people walk by them and they might be interested in one or another for their artistic quality. But when they saw these drawings, it was like, oh, I get it. He put olives inside the inside <laughs> that menorah. They had olive oil in in ancient Israel. That makes so much sense. How clever is that? You know, so people have 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 you know, it's a point of engagement, education, and that's really what I'm all about at the museum. That it it isn't just a place to come look at things that nobody uses. It's a place to look at things that had a life and that can be interpreted in a modern and sort of whimsical way. So. That is, you know, my assessment of whether or not it's sacrilege. Other questions? I think another one just came in from Lynn. Okay. Hi, Lynn. Hey. <laughs> Lynn's a colleague. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good to be here. It's been great, Abby. 
Oh, 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 that's interesting that his drawing of the Havdala spice box yep. mm -hmm. um, had the top flag in the opposite direction of the original. I don't think there's any meaning behind it. I can certainly ask him. I'm just curious. Yeah. <laughs> I it, thought that's odd. It probably might have just looked better it, artistically. You know, there's always the opportunity for artistic license, and he might have just felt. And of course, yeah. if I if I turned that that I could turn oh, it around and it right. would be facing exactly how it was. Yeah, but then the other flags would be switched. It's, it's, I'm not sure how he was looking at it when he made it. That's probably the, that's yeah. probably the better answer. Just curious. I thought it was odd. Yeah. yeah, that's probably the better answer, that he was probably looking at it from the other direction. <laughs> Anything else? Uh, looks like another question from Dorothy. He says he invents visual metaphors adapted from Jewish symbols and iconography. What were the most significant icons? Um, you know, I, I think I, I've shown you some of them. Um, you know, the, the, the things that people identify with, um, with Judaism are the Star of David, the menorah, um, the, the pomegranate, the, uh, the Lion of Judah, the Ten Commandments, you know, so these are things that he, you know, brings into his work. Now, in the case of this body of work, he was, you know, essentially copying directly from actual objects. He was, he was, appropriating them to make these drawings and to to give them a um, modern and um, whimsical feel. So uh, that's, you know, in this case, these were direct translations um, with some changes, but um, in, you know, he, he does reflect often in his, his work that's more freehand, um, these same symbols because they are so well known and so um, sort of ubiquitous in Jewish, uh, in Jewish artistic tradition. Okay, to, to follow that up, Abby, yes. uh, I'd like to follow that up with your last lecture that we attended. I've been on the icons of the women, the mm -hmm. matriarchal lineage, you know, starting with the Venus of Willendorf and then the Madonnas. Mm -hmm. Where in Jewish are, are the women? <laughs> Do you have another hour? <laughs> um, so, you know, this is interesting because it just came up today. Um, someone on our staff is doing a series on um, Jewish, strong Jewish women mm -hmm. and, um, you know, the, in the Bible. So there are, there are many, but, um, it was not really traditional or typical to see them depicted very often in art. Um, modern artists are now approaching that. For instance, Archie Rand, who we just, we had his show at the Skirball. Um, and if you want to sort of watch a virtual tour of that, um, which does have several women depicted in, you know, important biblical women. Um, we have a virtual tour on our on our website now with the the curator of that show. So uh, it's it's only about it's under an hour and she's wonderful. So um, yeah, so like people like Miriam, um, Jephthah's daughter is uh, it, it's a terrible story. Jeph Jephthah's Jephthah's daughter, but it has emerged as a a story about strength of of uh, of, of women. Um, you know, then there's of course Judith, um, but that she's that's not in the Bible. A Hanukkah story isn't a biblical story. So um, Judith, not the, not I'm sorry, um, it's not it, it's it's often thought of around Hanukkah, but the story of Judith is apocryphal. So it's you know there's there's there are a lot of women who um, you know who we we now in in modernity look to as examples, but uh, in, in earlier art, they, they were far and few between it, it you know, it was a, it's interesting because it, it, it's, it's a very patriarch, patriarchal faith, but 
being Jewish is made you, it comes through the mother, like the, you know, so they, they can't really go figure. get it. Yeah, go figure. Exactly. <laughs> so, um, so, and, and I, I would venture to say that, um, you know, if you, if you look at uh, Renaissance art, you know, you could, there, there are tons of depictions of, of Judith. Um, particularly by an, a female artist named uh, Artemisia Genaleschi. Do you know that? You should read about her. Artemisia, R A R T E M I S I A, Genaleschi, G E N T I L I S C H I. If you put that in, it'll somebody it'll come up right. There's a wonderful. Um, exhibition that was done, I think at the Met, uh, she had a, a very traumatic life experience of being raped and she became obsessed with the story of Judith and, uh, and, and you know, Judith slayed Holofernes, she cut his head off, it, you know, it's a, a very brutal story and, um, it's it's all about that you know her whole life was about avenging this you know terrible uh, experience that she had and using the story of Judith and making it every time she did the image more and more gory you know because she just she just needed to do that to address her own demons so um, there are lots of depictions of Jewish women in Renaissance art. Um, not by Jewish artists, you know, and not for the purpose of learning about Judaism. You know, the Jewish stories were part of uh, the underpinning of the New Testament. So they were used for Christian purposes. So oh, thank you for <laughs> spelling that out, Geneva. <laughs> it's in the chat. <laughs> Hopefully that's helpful. I also put links to the other- You're uh, terrific. You're the terrific. exhibit and the virtual tour you mentioned. Yeah. Were there any other questions before we we wrap up? I know we're getting close busy. to eight thirty Eastern. Yeah. So. Well, good to be with you all again. Thank you so much for indulging me um, <laughs> and for your good questions. You know, you, there are some groups that. Are, are very passive and I love, I love all of your questions and I love having the opportunity to engage with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abby, it was great. Any yeah. other final questions, comments, last chance? All right, everyone. Nope. <laughs> all right, well, thank you so much, Abby. I really have, appreciate your time and- Sure, have a great weekend, everybody. Thanks, Abby. Have great a good night. Take care.